Let's turn now, friends, to Exodus 24, <clears throat> which we read together, and we can take verse 12 of that chapter for a reference this morning. Exodus 24, verse 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. <clears throat> well, friends, it's not my intention uh, to expound the Ten Commandments, which you possibly would have expected, given that our last sermon was from chapter 19, and naturally we would perhaps have gone into chapter 20, where the Ten Commandments are recorded for us. But perhaps we look at these commandments at some other time. But we should spend time considering the meeting here between God and Moses on Mount Sinai, because this was a hugely significant meeting. And I think we, or I would as a minister, be neglectful in my duty if I didn't comment on that meeting. What took place between them, quite apart from God delivering the Ten Commandments, is intriguing to look at it. It is significant and it is hugely important. It was to the children of Israel, it is to the Christian church, and it remains so for the entire world. Now, the difficulty um, I had in deciding to move to chapter 24 is that it is an immensely difficult thing to do, to put into order how events developed up on that mountain. And the information on that picture is scattered throughout a number of chapters in the book of Exodus. So I'm going to try and give you as clear a picture as I could compile, gleaning from a number of those chapters. Now, um, in chapter 19, we looked at two parts of that chapter, and we read in the last verse, in chapter 19, that Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. Immediately after that, chapter 20, verse 1, God spake all these words. And that follows the Ten Commandments. But here's the question. To whom did God speak on that occasion? Was he speaking to Moses, or was he speaking to the children of Israel? And who spoke those words? Was it actually God, or was it Moses, or was it an angel? And I'm just raising here questions that often raise, rise in the minds of those who read the narrative of Exodus. At which stage of this process, was it before or was it after these events that God wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone? And a final question, how many times exactly did Moses climb that mountain? Have you ever been able to figure that out? Well, if you haven't studied it very carefully, you won't. Now, perhaps in one sense, we don't really need to know these details. It's not as if our salvation depends on it. The thief on the cross didn't know anything about these details, yet he was saved. But at the same time, in the ordinary course of events in the Christian church, God expects us to learn 
the most significant features of biblical history, features that have a direct bearing upon our own standing before God. If for no other reason, then we can perhaps explain these things to our children and to our children's children, and it might be passed on to the generations yet unborn. So let's look first of all at Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, as I mentioned, it's a challenging question. How many times did Moses climb that mountain? Indeed, how often did God give the Ten Commandments to Moses, verbally or written in stone? Is that clear in your mind? And to what purpose did God give these commandments in the first place? Now, before I go further in this, it's important to note that these commandments weren't new as far as God is concerned. They weren't new because these commandments were known to generations before Moses was ever born. In fact, these commandments, they were known in the Garden of Eden, they were known before the flood, they were known in Abraham's generation. The only difference was they weren't written. But God did write them into the DNA of every human being. Every human being has the law of God written in their hearts. That's what the Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans 2 verse 15. People, he says, show the law of God written in their hearts. That's why people have their conscience either accusing them or excusing them, because the law is written deep into our DNA. Now, when you look at uh, some of the events that unfolded in uh, early uh, history, such as Cain killing his brother. Cain knew it was wrong to kill his brother. How did he know? His wild animal in the field could kill another animal and nobody could bother about it. But Cain knew it was wrong to kill his brother. Why? Because his conscience told him. The generation that lived before the flood of Noah, they knew they were being sinful in their conduct because their conscience was telling them that. Meanwhile, God's purpose at Sinai was twofold. He wrote those laws to codify in the simplest possible terms his laws for our benefit so that we could open our Bibles at Exodus 20 or open our Catechism and read there in 10 simple commandments how God wants us to live religiously and morally. That was the first purpose of writing his laws on tablets of stone. But by the way, uh, in the Old Testament, nobody used that phrase, the 10 commandments. They weren't known as the 10 commandments. They were known as the ten words. Uh, sure some of you are familiar with the term the Decalogue. That's how the Old Testament people refer to these laws. The Decalogue means ten words. In other words, the laws were summarized into that simple category of ten words. Simplicity in itself. Now, what God has done when he compiled those Ten Commandments, he encapsulated within those Ten Laws the very best of religious and moral conduct. They've never been bettered, they've never been matched in world history, although men did try to do both. In the Old Testament, the Babylonians 
try to outmatch the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words that the Jewish people had, the Hebrew people had. So the Babylonians created their own version of the Ten Commandments, and it was called the Code of Hammurabi. But they were nowhere near the caliber of God's Ten Commandments. In more recent times, um, this began in America, a group of atheists and secularists, they decided that they would redraft the moral law familiar in the world. So they asked for submissions from the likes of themselves scattered in nations throughout the world. They asked for submissions so that they could compile their collective wisdom together and produce for the world a code of moral conduct that would set aside the laws of God. And they got a phenomenal response. And they did produce this code. But it was nothing but an atheist charter. There was no word about God, and there was no word about truth in it. So in no way does it cast aside the commandments of God. Now, meanwhile, the second purpose God had in given the commandments in written form was to prepare the Hebrew people to live as a nation state in Canaan. We saw something of this in chapter 19, verse 6. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So these laws will provide for them the moral and religious parameters within which they would live and have to live in Canaan. Now, my friends, that applies to ourselves as well. That's what the, the Ten Commandments, that's what they do for us. They provide parameters for us, and we are not allowed to wander over those parameters. Religiously, first three commandments. Morally, from five to ten, and we have the Sabbath day. That's all we need to live to the glory of God. So within those parameters, we should live our lives. Now, the alternative to that, any alternative to that, leads to two things, chaos and confusion. And that's relevant to us here living in Scotland. Because some of you know, and we spoke about this on Wednesday night at our congregational meeting. Last Monday, a new law came into force in Scotland. It was called the Hate Crime Bill or Hate Crime Law. And at the heart of that law is a challenge, if not even a dismissal, of God's moral code. Because the SNP government are insisting that they know best how one should love one's neighbor. How one should love one's neighbor. Now, when you consider that law that came into force last Monday and the Ten Commandments of God, what have we got? We've got these laws with a track record of 3,500 years. And during that time, they benefited humanity no end. And we've got this new law. It's less than a week old and has already proved to be chaos and confusion. The police have already received 4,000 complaints under this law, the worst is yet to come. There is no parallel. There is no substitute for the Ten Commandments of God. Meanwhile, Moses climbed Sinai. Uh, in chapter 19, we have three references to his climbing the mountain. Verse 3, verse 8, and verse 20. But that was all preliminary to receiving God's laws. Now remember, Moses received other laws from God, 
namely, there were three categories, the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. Moral, civil, and ceremonial. In total, do you know how many laws God gave Moses up that mountain? 613 laws. A total of 613. Now, these were all important to the nation state of Israel. And by the way, some of them in the uh, ceremonial and in the civil laws, some principles inherent to that, they don't apply anymore in the New Testament era. But some of the principles there still are relevant to ourselves. But I haven't got time to go into that. By far, the most important were the Ten Commandments, and that's what our focus has to be. So to discover how many more times Moses climbed the mountain, we must, as I said at the beginning, refer to various chapters in the book of Exodus. Now, evidently, he went up the mountain a further four times. So that's seven times in total Moses climbed that mountain. The four more times are in chapter 20, verse 21, chapter 24, verse 15, chapter 32, verse 30, and chapter 34, verse 4. Now, that's why I said to you, if you're going to study this, you're going to have to glean through all of these chapters and compile all that information to get a clear picture. Now, um, early in the process, now, I find it difficult to identify exactly when some of these things happen. But early in this process, Moses spent, in this chapter, verse 24, 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain with God. Now, he did that a second time in chapter 34, verse 28. He was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Now, exactly when this first time was, I'm just not altogether sure. Now, as I said, um, God gave Moses a total of 631 laws. I think it was during those 40 days and 40 nights that he was given those laws, this first time he spent 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain. But in any case, when that was given to him, it seems to me that Moses then descended the mountain to meet with the children of Israel. And that's what we have at the close of chapter 19, verse 25. Moses went down unto the people and spoke unto them. And immediately after that, the Ten Commandments were broadcast to the children of Israel in chapter 20. Now, as I said earlier, it's not clear to me exactly who spoke those Ten Commandments. Yes, it says, chapter 20, verse 1, God spoke all these words. But was it God through Moses? Or was it God through the angels? Or was it God speaking audibly from heaven? That's quite possible. <coughs> and not only is it possible, it's suggested by what God said in chapter 20, verse 22. You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. But whoever actually spoke, the words carried divine power, gravitas, and authority. Now, at this stage, there's no mention of the stone tablets. And it seems to me that the Ten Commandments were given, first of all, verbally. That the Ten Commandments were spoken verbally before they were given on the stone tablets. So when God gave Moses the first stone tablets, we're told something very significant. There's a reference to them here in our text, but it's elaborated on in chapter 31, verse 18. When God made an end of communing with Moses, he gave him two tables of stone. Now, look at this. Written with the finger of God. That's a very deliberate statement. And it's saying three things to us as well as to the people who were present at Mount Sinai. Number one, it's saying to us, that out of the 613 laws, God chose 10 for our special attention. 
out of the whole uh, band of laws, 613, he's saying to us, I'm giving you 10 for your special attention. The second significant thing to do with this finger is that these 10 carry God's signature. That's what the finger symbolizes. It's his signature on those stone tablets. And the third thing that the stone tablets conveys to us is that these laws are permanent in world history. They will never change. They're with, with us until that trumpet blows on the day of judgment, written into stone. Now, I'm sure that you've heard myself or others using the term moral absolutes. This is where we get it from. Moral absolutes, a phrase that means we have moral laws that will never change. We have moral laws that can never be adjusted without consequence. We have moral laws that should never be added to and never be subtracted from. In other words, what they meant at Mount Sinai 3,500 years ago, they still mean today. So it's the finger of God, my friends, that insists that we must honor our parents, that it is wrong to kill, that adultery is a sin, that stealing is wrong, that truth is crucial, that covetousness is harmful. It is the finger of God that tells us that. And that simple formula, my friends, for human conduct, it transcends all cultural barriers. It transcends all religious barriers. And as I said, they harm no one, they help everyone. Whereas this new hate law and hate crime law in Scotland does the very opposite. God says, the fulfilling of my law is love. Romans 13, 10. Love is the fulfilling of the law. In contrast to that, this new law in Scotland itself hates those who try to live by God's laws. It hates those who try to live by God's law. How then ironic is it that they have named it a hate crime law? That's exactly what it is. Let me move on to look at these stone tablets. Verse 12 in our chapter. I will give thee tables of stone. And then in chapter 31, God gave Moses two tables of stone written with the finger of God. Now, there is more mystery here because God could just as easily have done this by a sovereign act of his will. Isn't that how he created the world? He just commanded the world to come into existence. The universe to come into existence. In Genesis 1, and God said, let there be. And there was. Why didn't he do the same with the commandment, with, 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 the, with the stone tablets? But he didn't. Indeed, this is where the angels come in, as far as I can understand the narrative. And I think that's confirmed to us that it was the angels who were involved in the giving of these stone tablets, confirmed to us by three different sources. First of all, Moses himself confirms it to us 40 years after this, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33, verse 2. God came with ten thousands of his saints. Now, that isn't referring to saints as in holy men and women. It refers to angels. God came with ten thousands of his saints, and from his right hand went a fiery law. That's a reference to the giving of the Ten Commandments of the Mount Sinai. Then David confirms it to us in the psalm we were singing a moment ago, Psalm 68, verse 17. God's chariots are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai. 
And then Paul confirms it in that portion we read in the New Testament, Galatians 3, it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. Moses was the mediator. It was ordained by angels. And that word ordained in the Hebrew language means arranged. It was arranged by angels. But in any case, Moses was given those tablets to show the children of Israel that this was their charter for living in Canaan set in stone. Now, before they could appreciate that amazing gift from God's hand, sadly and tragically, they fell victim to the roaring lion, Satan. You know, my friends, after Jesus Christ, there's nothing Satan hates more than God's law. He hated it then, and he hates it still today. So he immediately planted a seed of discontent amongst the children of Israel. As soon as he became aware of what was happening up the mountain, he planted a seed of discontent, making the people complain of the time Moses spent up on the mountain. So they demanded of his brother, Aaron. This is in chapter 32, verse 1. Make us gods, Aaron, for this Moses, we don't know what's become of him. You see, my friends, the centuries they spent living in Egypt had a lasting and permanent effect on many of them. They were surrounded every day for 400 years by all sorts of gods and all sorts of vulgarity in the land of Egypt. And the favorite idol worship, the idol image in Egypt, was interestingly a bull calf. A bull calf. Now remember, they've just heard the voice of God commanding them, thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image. Yet here they were, begging Aaron, make us gods. And inexplicably, Aaron did. He told the people, all right, this is in chapter 32, verse 2, break off the golden earrings and bring them to me, and I will make you a god. And he got to work in defiance of God, Chapter 32, verse 4, he fashioned it with a graving tool and made a molten calf. The same kind of idol worship they saw in Egypt. That wasn't enough. Offending God even more, they threw a party to celebrate. Chapter 32, verse 6, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's what greeted poor Moses when he came down the mountain holding those two tablets of stone in his hand. Chapter 32, verse 19. Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and his anger waxed hot. <clears throat> Isn't it hard to understand, my friends? how this could happen to a great man like Aaron, how he could fall so easily into the temptation of Satan. I've always struggled to get my head round how easily Aaron fell into that temptation. But he did, my friends, and that's the tragedy of it. And what a warning to ourselves. If great men like Aaron fall so easily into temptation, how much more easily we can fall into the same temptations. 
I dare say that none of us can claim to have the faith that Aaron had. But there they were. Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and his anger waxed hot. He was both heartbroken and livid with anger. We read, he cast the tables out of his hand and broke them. Now, whether he meant to do that or not, I'm not very sure. But there they lay. The stones God carefully carved out with his own hand from the rock and gifted them to Moses. They are now lying, broken on the ground and they become symbolic of what is now a broken law and a broken covenant between God and his people. Oh, praise the Lord that is merciful, my friends. What does he do? Does he call fire and brimstone down on those people? No. He orders Moses back up the mountain once again. This time, things were going to be different. First of all, Moses went on a fast. Now, I'm not very sure, even after studying this for a long time, was that a voluntary fast on the part of Moses, or did God demand the fast? But he went on a fast. And he was 40 days and 40 nights without food and water. Chapter 34, verse 28. He did neither eat bread nor drink Moses. Didn't drink water. Now Moses was demonstrating to God his grief and his sorrow over what his brother had done. That was the first thing that was different. He had to fast. The second thing that was different, God this time refused to provide the stones. In the first time, he provided them. He, perhaps through angels, carved the stones out of rock. But this time, no. He said to Moses, you carve them. You have to cut them. Chapter 34, verse 1. God said to Moses, hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. This Moses did to his credit, but he wasn't allowed to write on them. He wasn't allowed to write on them. This was still God's law, and it would be the finger of God that would again carve these laws into the rock. I will write upon these tables, God said, the words that were in the first law. So despite what happened, the new stone tablets carried the exact same laws as the first one. The message was plain to the children of Israel and to ourselves. There can be no change, no alteration, no alternative, no adjustment to the Ten Commandments of God. I think that's why Jesus said what he did in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5. I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. In fact, he said, not one jot, nor one tittle shall in no wise pass from that law till all be fulfilled. One more note I want to give you in connection with this law. Later on, God ordered that these two tablets of stone would have to be kept in a very special place. And they were placed into the Ark of the Covenant. This was a special box that had a special room in the tabernacle and in the temple later on, called the Holy of Holies. Now, there the two stone tablets remained for the next 800 years. 800 years until Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem. 
Now, what's important to notice from our point of view is that during all that time, those 800 years, those stone tablets containing the broken law of God had to be covered. They had to be covered and they remained covered day and night for 800 years. Now, the top of the box that covered them was called the mercy seat. Called the mercy seat. Why? Because the broken laws underneath testified to the sin of humanity. And there was one message to Jew and to Gentile, a message of condemnation over every sin. That's what the law does. It condemns every sin. That's why the top of the box was called the mercy seat. But that wasn't enough. That mercy seat then had to be sprinkled with blood once every year to atone for the sins of the children of Israel. Now, my friends, let me close with this. All the symbolism converges on Calvary, converges on the cross of Calvary, because that broken law continues to condemn every sinner. It's the law that brings home to us that we are sinners. Romans chapter 3, by the law is the knowledge of sin. However, praise God's name, he has given us a way out of that condemnation. A way out of that condemnation. Galatians 3, we read, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. The law won't save us, but the law will bring us to that place where we realize, I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. And furthermore, I need that sprinkled blood, not on the mercy seat of a box, but the sprinkled blood of Christ over my soul, because only the blood of Christ can cleanse our sin away. Let me close with this. The more God's laws are dismissed or replaced today, the less knowledge of sin there is in society. Let me repeat that, and I'm stressing this because of the developments in Scotland in this past week. The more God's laws are dismissed or replaced in society, the less knowledge of sin there will be in our society. And the less people think about their sin, the less likely they will seek salvation in Jesus Christ. And that's the real danger of any destruction regarding the law of God. But especially for us in Scotland, the destruction caused by this obnoxious so-called hate crime law. My friends, let us pray and pray desperately and diligently that our nation would return to the laws of Sinai, that our nation would return to the cross of Calvary, that our nation would return to the gospel message of love, pardon, salvation, and forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank thee for thy mercy and thy kindness, thy goodness, thy patience. We thank thee for the forgiveness that is found in thee, for the 
blood of Jesus Christ <coughs> that cleanses us from all our sins and how much we need to be under that shed blood. Have mercy upon us. Prepare us for whatever remains in the day. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Stand out to receive the benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.